Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, AOL, uh, Alex Gunares and Curtis Brown for allowing me to come here and give this talk. Uh, I actually work for another company now. Uh, and I'd like to uh, say thanks to my current company, Docomo Innovations in Palo Alto, for uh, letting me come here and talk about uh, the work that, I do, uh, that I've done with AOL. Um, the title of, of this work is Building Data Parallel Pipelines in Erlang, and it sort of connects to the previous talk I've, uh, uh, I've had last year in uh, Erlang Factory in London. Uh, it's a little bit level up uh, in, in the sense that I get to talk about the things I didn't get to talk about last year, and uh, maybe run uh, some more experiments, uh, more in-depth analysis, and uh, go beyond MapReduce to iterative algorithms. And uh, I, I'd like to share this architecture and these results with, uh, with everyone here and probably uh, possibly get some feedback from you guys. So feel free to stop me anytime with questions. Uh, here's the outline of the talk. Uh, First, I'll make an introduction to data parallel. Chances are, if you're here, you already know what data parallel is. Uh, but there's been uh, recently a real uh, trend, uh, almost a craze in data parallel computing across many levels of granularity. And I'd like to emphasize that trend and to see how, uh, to sort of uh, put it in the framework where we can explore uh, Erlang and how Erlang can contribute to this uh, trend. Uh, then I'll talk about some requirements, a very simple set of requirements for uh, data analytics for, for building parallel flows. Uh, I will recap on MapReduce flows. Uh, I'm coming from Hadoop world where everyone is running MapReduce. I'd like to sort of connect to MapReduce framework because many people know about it. And sort of starting from MapReduce, make sure that we can do it in Erlang, of course we can, but also that we can go beyond that and run iterative or incremental algorithms. Uh, then uh, we'll have an architecture overview and flow specification language. And uh, I'll talk about the practical application of uh, uh, a practical instance of an iterative flow. That's a constant rank flow where I build a system that uh, analyzes Wikipedia graph, Wikipedia links of concepts, and assigns a unique uh, rank or score to each concept in the, in the graph. It's like a page rank, like a Google page rank algorithm. Um, finally, I'll show some results. I'll show some ganglia monitoring uh, results as well and talk about the conclusion and the future. Here are very simple requirements. We want to support uh, MapReduce computational model but we also want to support iterative models and incremental models. And why I'm saying this is that, of course, there are many other computation models, but uh, if you have Hadoop and you run MapReduce, uh, you can still run it iterative algorithms and you can run uh, graph analysis algorithms, but chances are they're going to be very slow. That's because you have shuffle and sort phase that spills over to the disk. You have in the reduce phase, um, uh, you, you write to the disk, then you would have to start another job for another iteration. And if you have 10 iterations with a lot of, lots of data, it will take a long time to do that. Uh, processing models, uh, the first, uh, actually the first and the most important model in this framework is in-stream stateless. Uh, maybe there's some small state that we can keep in memory, but I'm thinking only or primarily about models that hold most of the data in memory. So if we have a state, it should have a fairly small footprint. In-stream stateful, uh, I already mentioned that, but of course, if you can do these two, uh, it, it will be fairly simple to do batch. And apart from in-memory models, we also support uh, uh, persistent models uh, with, with disk persistence. Uh, as a computation platform, this is very well suited for the cloud. We had a uh, talk uh, related to the cloud, and I'll talk a little bit about optimization within the flow, but the same, uh, the same couple of slides can apply to cloud and any kind of virtualized resource. You, you may have a private cloud, uh, a VMware virtualized cloud, where you allocate instances on demand based on the load on your uh, cluster, 
And uh, this applies equally well to both. And of course, it, it applies to bare metal. I've done all experiments on uh, bare metal cluster. So let's talk first about the data parallel trend. Uh, you can really see today everywhere, and I sort of plucked out a couple of, uh, a couple of important instances that I found out, uh, uh, out there. Um, and one of them is, for example, R, language for uh, scientific computing. Uh, it's, uh, it's open source. Uh, R is going parallel, so you have a lot of R packages that enable you to, to run uh, R in a parallel environment, be it on a multi-core machine or on a cluster of nodes. Uh, or on Hadoop. Uh, there are companies actually uh, working with uh, R on Hadoop today. Uh, Mathematica has a cluster version which is called Grid Mathematica. Uh, MATLAB uh, has a parallel tool toolbox that runs on a cluster of nodes. So everyone definitely realizes that there is a big uh, advantage that people want to analyze data faster and want to move that way. Uh, grid Mathematica actually supports uh, also GPGPU computing. So if you have NVIDIA uh, uh, GPU card on your, uh, on your instance, you can, uh, you can uh, make use of it. Uh, I actually run it on this uh, laptop. Uh, on, uh, on the internet for big data analysis, Yahoo has uh, S4 framework for uh, stream analytics. Uh, Google has um, sort of, uh, okay, let's say, uh, uh, this is more on, at, at the language level. There is a very nice paper about Flume Java where you can write and, spe and spec out parallel flows in a language that is uh, vaguely similar to Java. It works on uh, parallel structures data structures. And uh, for example, Cloudera, but also the whole um, Hadoop community is, uh, Hadoop is coming up with MR2, that's the next version of MapReduce that will support also other uh, ways of doing parallel computing, like MPI, for example. And Crunch is kind of like Flume Java, uh, uh, open source version of Flume Java, on, uh, and, and it's, it started inside Cloudera. Um, I already mentioned GPGPU computing or uh, uh, multi-CPU, multi-core models and clusters. So when we talk about parallelism, we will talk about all these different levels. So what is really data parallel? Let's say, uh, you know, if we have a vector and we want to apply a function f of, the f of x, x to, uh, to that vector, uh, in the iterative process, you will write a for loop or something, go and uh, apply that function to, uh, to all, all elements in turn, uh, probably run on a single core. But let's imagine for a moment that we have this magic operation with uh, two bars that says essentially spread this. And if you have a cluster, if you have a bunch of CPUs, if you have a multi-core, you uh, send these uh, computations to different cores and compute uh, this function. <coughs> now, many people talk about data parallelism and task parallelism, and you know, in fact, uh, sometimes data parallelism requires task parallelism because you have to spawn some processes, uh, dispatch them to to another node, or. Uh, push them to, to a core or a CPU uh, to do something for you. And very rarely, this is actually implemented in hardware and it's very expensive. So we will talk more about sort of task parallelism induced by data parallelism here. Here's a small, uh, a short recap from last year. Uh, we showed how to build MapReduce flows or MapReduce chains of flows uh, using Erlang on a small cluster of 10 nodes and here I show a typical flow used in uh, advertising to build user profiles and then to uh, compute some frequencies of accesses to certain properties on your advertising network. Uh, and these numbers show how many workers I have in each layer here. So I have a bunch of events coming into the system. <coughs> a scanner scans those events, uh, builds, the builds user profile, 
profiles and aggregates them in uh, an ads table here, in a, in a series of 120 uh, ads tables. Then another bunch of scanners start scanning these user profiles and uh, co uh, compute some campaign uh, frequency uh, uh, metrics and then aggregates that it, and puts it in another ads table. And then another scanner uh, aggregates that across, all, uh, across only two nodes. By the way, this first part runs on all 10 nodes and the second part runs on only two nodes. We wanted just to have result on two nodes so that uh, uh, consumers can connect and uh, get the data they need. Here's another example flow. Uh, maybe it's clear, it's a little bit different, and it's more appropriate for the architecture as we have it today. Uh, in general, you have a bunch of event sources that are outside your system. It can be a, a source uh, feed coming from your advertising server. It can be a click stream coming from your uh, web pages, whatever you want. And these sources all feed into your uh, into your infrastructure, and in your infrastructure you have first the input layer where, say, you stage that in uh, ads or dads tables in Erlang, and then you have a bunch of scanner processes in Erlang that scan through these tables in parallel across multiple nodes and push them to some processing layer where something is done with those events. It could be filtering, it could be some computation, uh, some enhancement of your events, and, and then uh, we can have an aggregation layer where we typically aggregate using a single key or a group of keys. And let's say in this case, we push it to a sync, uh, which is amnesia table distributed across all nodes. And then consumers can access amnesia table and get whatever they, they need from it. This is very typical flow in any industry actually. And uh, it, leads itself nicely to, uh, lends itself self nicely to uh, building actual plugins with fairly fixed uh, functionality so that you can actually, instead of writing Erlang code, you can just refer to those plugins, uh, plugins as Erlang, mo Erlang modules and functions. And uh, that way you can sort of build on top of Erlang and you can, uh, you can create a separate language a flow specification language, and I will talk a little bit about uh, that idea in, in the next couple of slides. <coughs> uh, so uh, here's the, the architecture. I, I propose a hierarchical architecture where first we have a flow process that is implemented as uh, OTP, uh, supervisor, monitor, and then we have a bunch of layers and fairly uh, sort of approximately each of these blocks here would be one layer. Uh, what is typical for a layer is that it has a bunch of Erlang processes, so you can, uh, in a way you can say that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a worker pool or a process pool, uh, but there's, there's something very, very common and characteristic about all processes that are running in, in one layer and that's they're all the same. They're all the same of the same type. They only run with different parameters. Uh, we use uh, ads, dads, amnesia, and TCP, UDP uh, for sources and sinks. And only these tables, ads, dads, amnesia for intermediaries. Intermediaries are really between uh, flows. So if we want to capture some data set and use it in subsequent flows, we can put it in what we call intermediary table. And then TCP and UDP, uh, we can uh, use it uh, basically as a source or as a sync. Uh, we can connect to TCP socket, listen to it, whatever comes in, the scanner will take it, do something with it and push it farther into the system. Um, message passing between layers can be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, in most of the experiments I will show here, I ran a asynchronous message passing. Uh, I already mentioned plugins. <coughs> this architecture very nicely lends itself to plugins. You can uh, build a ho the whole library of plugins 
and then the user really doesn't have to be aware about uh, Erlang and Erlang functionality. He can just specify plugins and use them as they are. Um, and some of the example layer parameters are layer size, layer ID, input and output, output data format, and connectivity with adjacent layers, and then uh, mapping functions between layers, and that's essentially how you pass data from one layer to another. Here with different colors, I indicate that these partitioning function can be different. Uh, it can be a round robin, uh, some uniform random function, hashing, or whatever suits you. Uh, here's uh, delving a little bit deeper in the structure of the layer. Layer consists of a bunch of workers, and it spawns and monitors workers, and it's elastic in the number of workers, which is very important if you run it on the cloud. You can adjust your number of workers uh, based on uh, demand you have on the platform. And also, typically, layer is allocated to a single node, uh, to a single Erlang or a single uh, virtual machine although there are cases where you can allocate it across multiple nodes as well. Um, workers perform uniform functions, and uh, this layer connects to other layers, sources, sinks, and intermediaries, and it may have additional resources, like for example, if I have to have a resource here in ETS table uh, that uh, all workers use, I will have uh, an ETS table connected to, to the layer, and workers can connect to the ads table and get whatever they need from it. I'll show one example later. Here's an example of sources, sinks, and intermediaries. Uh, so let's say one source can be a bunch of ads tables. I already mentioned TCP and UDP. I, I mentioned DATS and NISI as well. And then intermediary has these two arrows in the sense that uh, data can come into the intermediary, can be uh, temporarily or uh, staged for a longer term, and then subsequent flows can connect to it and scan these tables and get data out of it. <coughs> so this way, with these basic connectivity uh, elements, you can really build very complex flows. Worker has basically three parts. The first part is input, where it accepts an event or a bunch of records in some format. It can be JSON, it can be plain text or XML. And then there is user-defined function, which can be a plugin, that acts on that record. And it produces some output, and that output is typically partitioned and sent to the next layer. All workers do the same thing, and all of them have exactly the same functionality in all three uh, places. But as always with data parallel computing, the trick is that each worker works on a different set of data. A couple of words about the flow language. Um, flow language is a specification language that acts on different levels. One level is infrastructure. So you want to specify parameters of your cloud or, uh, or your uh, cluster, your VM cluster. You want to specify your hardware, the hardware you're running your flow on. And you also want to specify platform. In this case, it's Erlang, but what is the node configuration for each Erlang node? How many nodes do we need to run per, per physical or virtual instance? What are the parameters of each Erlang node? Uh, how many uh, CPU cores do we want to use? And so on. And you need to point it to a code repository. Where, where is the framework? Where are the plugins? So just initialize all these directories and pass them on to the Erlang node so that Erlang can use it. At the application level, we have application libraries, and uh, we have a flow specification language, and I will mainly talk about these items in bold here. Uh, in flow specification language, we specify flow infrastructure. What are we using for sinks and sources? What are we using for um, <coughs> workers? Uh, flow structure uh, specifies a flow graph, which is uh, connectivity between layers and connectivity between sources and sinks and other layers. And then uh, flow replication, which is if you want to replicate a flow, make sure that it's more reliable, you can do it. 
and you can specify replication factor, uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 will, it will happen. Um, optimization, well, you can optimize flow, uh, and I will show an example where I change the number of workers in a layer in order to increase or decrease network traffic or CPU utilization and decrease overall running runtime. And then monitoring really how, how you, this is not really ganglia monitoring or system monitoring, it's more like flow monitoring. So you want to understand what happens when you change cert certain parameters in the flow, uh, how much uh, CPU core utilization increases, how much disk I.O. increases and so on. So um, in general, the, the structure I'm following here is really a, a structure very typical for cloud today. You have infrastructure layer, infrastructure as a service, platform layer, and application layer. Platform as a service, application as a service, or software as a service. So this is very uh, sort of immediately transferable to, uh, to the cloud. Let's see some uh, uh, specific examples of a flow language uh, of a flow spe specification. Let's say that we run this on a hardware of uh, eight nodes. Uh, this, these are physical nodes. We put them on eight machines and we put some machine specs here. Optimizer or scheduler can use these machine specs to better optimize the flow. For example, if I'm reaching a, a limit of 128 gig of RAM, I can try to reduce a little bit data inflow, uh, do some load shedding or something like that. Then I can also modify uh, Erlang VM uh, parameters or reduce the number of processes so that, so that I utilize these 16 cores the best, in the best possible way. <coughs> uh, here are the, uh, the examples of Erlang node specs. Uh, we have node names. Uh, we have, okay, here's the directory where the data resides. Here's the configuration file. We can put, uh, you know, all our line parameters in configuration file or put them separately here. And in this case, I decided to basically point all nodes to the same Erlang VM, but they can be different. Actually, you can have multiple VMs for a single physical node, and that will work as well. Uh, data sources. Uh, typically, you define a type, is it ads, is it that stable, uh, give it some name, ID, and give it a size, which means this is how many tables I have. And typically, tables will be, uh, will be uh, named by uh, this name plus uh, integer from one to size. So we'll have here outcome events one, outcome events two, and so on. And then we define a sync. In this case, it's amnesia table. Uh, and the table is the name of the table is user profiles. Now we specify the processing graph uh, and all layers and workers. So there are three basic layers: one is scanner, one is processor, one is aggregator. This roughly corresponds to the slide I shown I have shown before. And the first layer is of a type scanner, so there is a way to define a layer type, and then all these apply actually to these layers. So these three layers actually act in, act in parallel, uh, AtCom scanner, AtTech scanner, and there's another scanner on the next uh, slide. So they're sort of at, at the same level. So when the data hits the system, it will hit all three uh, layers at the same time. Uh, this is a scanner, and it has a predecessor, Atcom events, that we de define it's a source. Uh, and uh, the operation mode is sequential parallel scan, so we'll, ha we'll have one process uh, access one table and scan it. At the same time, concurrently, the other process will access other tables and scan them. The successor to this uh, layer is a processor layer. And then uh, there's a partitioning function. So each worker will call this function with add com parameter and pass the data on to the next layer with, uh, by using that function. This is the function that we wrote in advance. It could be a plugin. Uh, so it's, uh, it's there on the disk and we can find it and use it. Communication in this case is concurrent and uh, asynchronous. Another layer 
same set of parameters uh, passing on to processors and communication again concurrent and uh, asynchronous. Uh, there's the next layer, uh, processor layer. And we say this is a worker type of layer, so it has workers that actually do something with your data. Uh, we specify all predecessors. We can simply say a scanner here as well, but we can also uh, put all uh, individual scanners here. And then uh, successor to this layer is aggregator, and we have a worker function that was defined in advance. It has no parameters. Again, communication parameter is there. Distribution local means that this whole layer is distributed on one node. And the size of this layer is 36. What is important to note here is that previous layer needs to take care of that when, for example, uh, if you use a hashing func function, that function has to know if you pass data to a layer that has 36 workers, uh, it, it needs to uh, generate an integer between 0 and 35 or 1 to 36. So uh, some inter interpreter layer, interpreter will take this data and make sense out of it. And the final layer is, is the aggregator, which is a Nisia table, and it applies aggregator function on Nisia table. Actually, it, it applies the aggregator function and it's size 36, but Nisia is a sync. So Nisia will accept these and it was already defined. Now, uh, this is the example of uh, concept rank. And this is an iterative algorithm that you typically run on large graphs uh, for search engines. Uh, we have that at Yahoo, we, uh, Google has it, and many other search engines have it. Uh, I will uh, explain uh, this uh, example, this problem space uh, on, the, on example of uh, Wikipedia. So let's say if we have a page about San Francisco, uh, we have somewhere on the page reference to San Jose, which is a city nearby, and um, that creates a link between a concept called San Francisco and concept called San Jose, California. Now do this across all concepts on Wikipedia and you will have a huge graph with about 3.1 3 million concepts and about 42 million links. Uh, now we want to run uh, something like a page rank algorithm on it so that we find which concepts are more important than the others. And this is related to a uh, probabilistic Markov model and it sort of applies to the following process. Let's say you're on the, on the web on, on a certain page and you want to compute the probability that you will go to any of the pages that, uh, 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 that are linked to that page. And your choice at any point doesn't depend on the previous choices. So this is a very similar thing. Uh, you're trying to compute here a page rank of San Jose, California, based on page rank of all pages that, that point to it. And then you take into account all pages uh, pointed to by San Francisco page. This is the count of those pages, L. And this is the page rank of page, of, of page San Francisco in this case. You sum up across all pages that link to San Jose, California, apply some uh, coefficient in normalization here, and you get a page rank of that page. So what is really important here is that this is a recursive formula. So you have to know uh, the pages, uh, the rank of the pages that point to your page before you calculate a new page. And another important thing is that this is iterative algorithm, so you have to run, uh, in my case, I run about 10 iterations before you uh, find a solution. If you were to do this on, in MapReduce, it will take uh, an extremely long amount of time because of this I.O. Here is what you get at the end, and this is just to say, well, it makes sense to do this because, for example, you can compute how important Wikipedia users or Wikipedia editors, uh, how important are different programming languages from their standpoint, uh, so, for example, Java and C have a, a rank of 133, 139, a score, let's say. Uh, so it seems to be fairly uh, well entrenched, built into this graph. There are a lot of pages pointing to these programming languages, whereas 
Scala and Erlang uh, still sort of making headways, uh, have fairly low score. Uh, Python is da up there as well. This is only on Wikipedia, so I hope it doesn't really reflect the, the, real, uh, the, the real world. And we have some uh, long-term languages like, like Pascal and Fortran there as well, uh, faring pretty well. C Sharp is doing well as well. <coughs> So here's the flow that is actually implemented on each node, uh, except for Mnesia that is sort of distributed across all nodes. Uh, this is a compute layer where I have, say, four workers, and these are the resources, and this is forward link map and backward link map. It contains references to all link pairs in my graph. And my workers actually access <coughs> Uh, workers access Amnesia table and using some partitioning scheme, and I'll talk about it in more detail in the next slide, uh, they access a certain portion of the Amnesia table and read from that table, compute uh, concept rank using fmap and bmap and push back uh, concept ID and concept rank to another table, to another new table in Amnesia. So one table is used exclusively for writes writes and one exclusively for reads. And this is run uh, in 10 iterations. So here's the worker. What the worker does is first it, it gets some token. It can be a hash or an integer. And if the token is equal to a p hash of that CID, so CR worker actually scans the table and gets out the CID and the score for that CID. And then computes a p hash of that CID, and if it's equal to the token, it computes a concept rank for that CID. This is just, just to spread load evenly across all workers and all nodes. So in doing that, the worker has to use backlinks from uh, BMAP, and it has to go through all backlinks and find the length of the uh, forward link set for that backlink and then compute some using the formula I showed in another slide. So what is really important here is that the structure of the graph impacts your computation. And you can hope that if you use a hashing function that you will evenly distribute the load but that's not always the case. It may happen that the distribution of nodes in the graph and links is such that it favors certain nodes. So every time you complete an iteration, you have to make sure that all nodes are done. And then finally, when the computation finishes, we push it to another table, CR7. So when we finish, we will have 10 tables in Nisia holding uh, different iteration, results of different iterations from concept rank. Here are some results, and I intentionally put them in this kind of diary form uh, because there's a lot of quality in, in writing data, in presenting data this way. Uh, I think there are a lot of pros and cons and trade-offs here that need to be taken into account. For example, uh, total memory use in this uh, Computation is about 420 meg, uh, 63 megabytes of resident memory. Amnesia um, is distributed across nodes. So uh, forward map is about 126 meg, uh, B map is 120 meg. Um, and then tables in Amnesia have about 3 million records and about 32 words of memory each. Uh, so yeah, this is a big data session, but this is not really big data. Um, you can easily run this on a, on a mobile phone. Um, and, and it's a scary thought. You know, you can have a cluster of mobile phones and run this easily. Um, but you, know, you can expand, you can, you, you, can, you can think that, you know, you can run this on a, 
uh, very, very large graph. And uh, I think as long as you partition it and you have enough resources, you should be okay with it. In this case, I have 128 gig of RAM on each machine, so I'm barely using a couple of percent percentage percentages of the total gig of, of the total RAM. Um, run times: uh, If you run a one worker process on one node, it takes about 15 minutes for 10 iterations. This is very close to Java execution time on, on a single node. I had a Java version before I started this one. And uh, if you run 10 worker processes on one node, uh, it drops down to 18. And so on, there are different combinations here that uh, have different trade-offs between CPU utilization and uh, network bandwidth. So for example, this one is the fastest, four nodes with five processes per node 8.83 minutes, which is about um, six times faster than uh, one process on one node. Uh, so it's kind of a good bang for the buck. Uh, but the network traffic is the highest of all uh, approaches, 35 megabytes per second, uh, but it's not high. So to further illustrate this uh, trade-off, uh, I ran all these configurations and uh, looked at uh, ganglia uh, monitoring charts. Uh, so this is the number of uh, nodes, the number of processes per node. And we see here, this is a total load on the cluster. By the way, this cluster has 10 nodes, but I used in this case between three and four. So only a part of it is really uh, showing some activity. And then um, here's the CPU load. Uh, this part you can ignore, this is just loading the data into uh, uh, resource tables, but these humps are important. And correspondingly, you can see the network traffic for each one. And this is the network traffic for the best, uh, best scenario where we have uh, four nodes and five processes per node, uh, 8.83 minutes. Uh, so this, this one is the fastest, but roughly, you know, when you look at this chart and this chart, you see that network traffic is very similar to your runtime. Uh, so make sure that you look at the network traffic, that's very important. Uh, now you think in the following way, well, if I know that for different configurations, I have different runtimes, different network traffic, and bandwidth utilization. I have to, uh, I, I can try and optimize this automatically and increase and decrease layer size so that I get a uh, better uh, response from the system. Typically, uh, it runs in a typical uh, backward control loop. Uh, you have, you set certain flow parameters like layer size, you run your flow, monitor picks status like execution time or memory use and uh, pushes it into monitor database and optimizer accesses monitor database and at each iteration com computes uh, the size of your flow. And then resets the flow parameters and the whole process starts again. So here's a very simple way to do it. It's not the best way, it's just to illustrate the point. But, uh, and also to show that it's easily doable in Erlang, uh, you can uh, start a swipe uh, from uh, one process per node to 20 processes per node. And then whenever you see that uh, your total execution time decreases, you keep going forward. When you see that it increases, you go back. So this way, uh, this very simple optimizer finds a minima right here. It's a local minima and it keeps bouncing between two and four processes per node. Of course, it's apparent that it doesn't discover the five processes per node point, which is the, the absolute minimum in this swipe. But still, it's a good point, and uh, another point is that it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, get trapped here, but it sort of oscillates between two and four all the time, and that, that's why we have these spikes in CPU utilization traffic. Of course, you can say best so far, and then it will be trapped here and execute and, and have a very flat curve here. Uh, now you can say, well, I want a globally optimal point and I want to 
try more nodes, maybe eight nodes. And this is what you get. Uh, this is the time, uh, I think this is time for one iteration. And uh, this is a swipe for one to 20 processes per node on four nodes. So you get uh, about the best point here, number five, uh, 50 seconds per iteration. In uh, eight node scenario, in general, you get faster response times, but um, uh, the fastest one is, I, I think, 38, 38 seconds with five uh, processes per node. So in general, in both cases, if you look at this polyno polynomial extrapolation, interpolation, you get uh, some kind of area where, uh, where your system performs in an in a optimal or suboptimal way. And those are the areas that you, you, you should target with your application. Uh, looking at the swipe from gangbang monitoring perspective, of course, as you increase the number of processes, the load on the cluster increases, on the CPU increases, and the load increases. And then uh, cache network is interest, network bandwidth is interesting because it initially increases and then starts to decrease because I, I, I think uh, processes spend a lot of time computing and actually send, uh, send out uh, results to Nisia much uh, slower. Uh, this is the conclusion slide. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I think Erlang is very convenient and, and appropriate to use for platform computing, cloud computing, and data parallel flows. Uh, I didn't even think about using some other language uh, like Java or uh, maybe C++, but um, uh, I think, uh, you know, it was very smooth and uh, as long as you know what you're doing, uh, after about a week, I was able to build that uh, CR flow. And uh, it is good to have uh, people in general, uh, especially in big data, uh, you have a, you have a a uh, job called data scientist. Uh, data scientists are not used to knowing programming languages or learning uh, some extreme programming languages like, Le like Erlang. So it would be great to isolate them from Erlang by building some platforms or spec languages that they can use and make use of this enormous power of distributed processing that Erlang offers. A uh, small Erlang team can actually do wonders. You can implement a bunch of plugins and uh, build a fairly sophisticated system in a very short amount of time if you have two or three good, good Erlang programmers. Uh, so I hope there is a great future for Erlang in, in this area, and certainly I'm looking forward to it. Any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, are, are you from AOL? No. No, <laughs> okay. That's, yeah, that's a very intricate problem and uh, we've been working on it for a while. <clears throat> First, in a large organization, there's uh, very often an understanding that uh, data should be, should be put first on, uh, uh, on disk storage, in, in some kind of disk storage, be it uh, NAS or Sun or whatever, and then, um, we had uh, disk storage built, um, we have a repository, disk repository, where we attach certain processes and we have clusters for running some jobs, some pre-processing on data before it's actually sent out to, for example, R&D where I work. Um, so you're right, uh, it's a, a big shift in thinking to say, now I want this data in real time piped from advertising servers to, uh, to my platform. And I want, to, I want that data to hit the platform in, in five seconds. 
but if you realize what kind of business advantage you're gaining from that, uh, I think that will get the people working and do the right thing there. So we looked at different platforms. We looked at Flume, for example. Uh, there are some other solutions now being developed, and I think uh, pretty soon it will, it will happen. Yeah, in this case, uh, I had in the previous flows, I had that case where I had to build uh, a boundary. And uh, what it is is basically, it's purely experimental. So you run the first flow here and say, this is my boundary, so I have to wait across all nodes until this user profile is ready. Um, you can run your flows on all nodes using, uh, say, uh, data flows from uh, a week or a month and measure uh, and build a distribution curve and say, okay, I know that in most cases these flows complete within a certain time. And then you can build a timer here that syncs up and go to, say, uh, mean plus minus three sigma and everything beyond that especially if I don't notice any uh, messaging here because aggregator is, uh, uh, user profiling is sending uh, messages to aggregator. So if I don't see any messages in a certain amount of time, the probability that my flow is done is very high. That's the point where I say trigger the next flow. Yeah, this, uh, this simple formula is all in Erlang directly, yeah. I don't know where it is, but you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Okay, thanks.